Hi to everybody uh, here in the room. Hello to everybody joining online. Uh, my name is Heather Williams, and I am the director of the project on nuclear issues here at CSIS. Uh, I'm still relatively new in this role. I think I'm two months in, and this is uh, the first po uh, public pony event for a wrong director. So I'm absolutely thrilled uh, that this is the topic, this is the occasion, and to see so many um, familiar faces in the room. Um, and I'm also really grateful to, um, to our speakers and uh, chairs um, for, for joining for this really important topic in, uh, at this time. Um, so, as you all know, uh, this event is about the Nuclear Posture Review. How do you hold an event on a document that is <laughs> unclassified? A few of you emailed with this question, and it is a great question. So, um, our approach was uh, to take what we already know about the NPR, remains classified, the administration has released uh, a fact sheet that gave us some a hint of what to expect. Nuclear deterrence will likely remain a pillar of the U.S. nuclear posture, alongside strategic stability through arms control and risk reduction measures. Um, with this growing anticipation of the NPR, the catchphrase that we're all familiar with now is integrated deterrence. Uh, and so part of today's discussion is also trying to tease out what integrated deterrence means and perhaps somewhat what we can expect in the NPR. But we also wanted to take a bird's eye view of the NPR itself, the NPR process, to understand what really went into the document that we are all anticipating sometime uh, in the autumn. If any of you ask me when it's coming out, I don't know. So I'm going to preempt that. Uh, I don't think any uh, anybody really knows for sure, uh, but hopefully sometime in the autumn, in this calendar year, uh, would be great, I think is what is the best that we can say. So we're really thrilled for, um, to all of you here and online for joining us for today's conversation. Uh, a few housekeeping items uh, just to get started. Uh, this conference is on the record and it is also being recorded. We encourage audience participation. I really mean this, that these panels and the structure is specifically designed for you all to be part of this conversation, ask the hard questions, stir the pot a little bit. Um, for those of you who are in person in the room, you will have two flashcards inside your folder on which you can write down questions. So if you do that, just hold the flashcard um, up in the air and somebody will come collect it and give it to the chair. Uh, we'll also be accepting questions from our virtual audience through the Q&A function so if you're online, please remember to submit your questions there. Um, I also want to and have to share with you our building safety precautions. Overall, we feel very secure in this building. Uh, but as a convener, we have a duty pr to prepare for any eventuality. I will serve as your responsible safety officer at this event. Hopefully there won't be any incidents, but if so, um, please follow any instructions that I uh, give should the need arise. And finally, please take a moment to familiarize, with our, familiarize yourself with our emergency exit pathways, which is right back there if you're in the room. Uh, so now back to the conference. To get us started, as I said, the kind of catchphrase going around, which we're all trying to unpack, is integrated deterrence. And so we're going to dive right into it. Uh, our first panel is on the topic, what is integrated deterrence? Uh, which will explore the definition, the audience, and the impact of the US strategy of integrated deterrence. And I'm absolutely thrilled um, that to chair this panel will be my colleague and friend, the director of the Smart Women Smart Power program here uh, in the International Security Program at CSIS, Kathleen McGinnis. Kathleen, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, Just test. Okay, this works. Um, Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. We're here, as Heather mentioned, to discuss integrated deterrence. Um, a concept that, as Heather sort of alluded to, is a, a, a bit of a head scratcher. Um, uh, to me, at least, deterrence is a mechanism to convince an adversary not to do something we don't want them to do or what, something we don't want to have happen. And being convincing in that messaging requires that all instruments of national power work together in an integrated fashion. But perhaps the emergence of the construct of integrated deterrence is actually a way to remind us that deterrence is a more holistic construct. And since nuclear matters have arguably been a little bit stovepiped or, or, uh, since the end of the Cold War, perhaps integrated deterrence is a way to signal to our institutions, our allies, and our adversaries that we are thinking about these mechanisms more holistically. 
So our panel here is designed to tease out some of the contours of this debate and help us build our frameworks for understanding integrated deterrence and key aspects of operationalizing that strategy. Um, some key questions that we're going to explore include, who's the target audience of integrated deterrence in US strategy? Is it adversaries or allies? How do we tailor integrated deterrence? How will integrated deterrence shape allies' views of ext US extended deterrence commitments? What are allies' perspectives and proliferation risks? And what should the US do in the event of nuclear deterrence failure? We are joined by an extraordinarily distinguished panel today. Um, Dr. Tom Nichols is Professor Emeritus of National Security Affairs at the Naval War College and a contributing writer to The Atlantic. He also teaches at the Harvard Extension School, where he helped design the certificate program in nuclear deterrence studies. He's author of several books, including No Use, Nuclear Weapons, and U.S. National Security. We are also joined by Dr. Stacy Pettyjohn, who is a senior fellow, fellow and director of the defense program at the Center for a New American Security. Her areas of expertise include, among many other things, um, defense strategy, posture, force planning, uh, to the defense budget, and war gaming. And prior to joining the Center for a New American Security, she spent over 10 years at the Rand Corporation as a political scientist. Uh, and finally, we're joined by S. Paul Choi, who's the Managing Director and Principal Advisor at Stratways Group, which is a geopolitical risk and security consultancy with a focus on Northeast Asia and the United States. His expertise is in political military affairs, international security, and strategy design. Until 2018, Mr. Choi was a strategist and international relations specialist at the United Nations Command Republic of Korea, U.S. Combined Forces Command, U.S. Forces Korea, which is quite a mouthful, <laughs> the, the acronyms, um, where he worked in both the Commander's Strategic Initiatives Group and the Directorate for Strategy, Policy, Plans, and Strategic Communications. So with that, if I could turn to uh, Dr. Nichols first, and then Stacy and, um, and uh, Mr. Choi, and we'll kick it off. Do you want us up there? Uh, where, where do you feel? I, I think there's a microphone okay. at your seat. Um, well, good morning. Um, I, it's really especially nice for me to be here uh, because I've come back home. I have uh, got my professional start here at CSIS back in 19... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would, I'll just say that I would, when I began working here, I was, in, I was a fellow in what was called the Soviet Project, so that will tell you how long ago that was. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, sorry, let me, before you get started, may I just interrupt? Is, is the microphone working? Is that working? Can everybody hear me? Is it working on, online? Can the online audience yes. hear how's, how's that? Better? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. That's what green means. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that I am no better at being at CSIS than I was 36 years ago, so uh, let me start again and say good morning and, and thank you. Um, we were asked to talk about integrated deterrence um, and deterrence failure. I will start by being candid, being the first up to say, I don't know what integrated deterrence means. Um, and I'm a little concerned that um, this is constructing um, a term that, in the way that every NDS, NSS, nuclear posture review does to say, we are a new administration, we are putting our mark on this, we are giving it some different name to distinguish ourselves from our predecessor. Now, in this case, because the difference in, in policy orientation is so dramatic from one administration to the next, I can understand why that would happen. But let me just throw out what the administration thinks uh, they mean by integrated deterrence. Um, this is Colin Call. In, in terms of integrated, we mean integrated across domains. So conventional, nuclear, cyberspace, informational. It is also integrated across theaters of competition, and potential conflict and integrated across the spectrum of conflict from high intensity warfare to the gray zone, which is in Washington speak, waving your arms and saying all this, um, which I understand, um, but I think, and we were kind of talking about this uh, ahead of the panel, I think that means things other than just threatening the use of strategic nuclear weapons, which 
it makes sense, but I guess maybe, and that's why I began by pointing out how old school I am originally here, that that looks to me like strategic nuclear deterrence plus what we just would call foreign policy. Um, that the rest of that sounds like foreign policy, and I'll, I'll just continue with, I'll quote um, Undersecretary Call again. Um, the concept in this case means integration of all instruments of national power. Most importantly, it means being integrated across our allies and partners, which are the real asymmetric advantage the United States has over any other competitor or potential adversary. We have to alert, work alongside our allies and partners so that our adversaries know they're not just taking on the United States, they're taking on a coalition of countries who are committed to upholding a rules-based international order. Or as I would call it, the foreign policy of the United States for you know 75 years. Um, plus nuclear weapons, uh, but but again, given that our that the previous administration was actively hostile to our alliance partners, was actively hostile to international organizations, I can understand why this administration is saying, no, no, we're coming back to deterrence that includes uh, using the entire all of the mechanisms of government in in tandem with our allies. If that's the point, then I, I get it, but I don't think it's that different. Um, from deterrence. And I think every concept should be definable by what it isn't. And what I wrestled with in this is, uh, as, as I read multiple um, administration um, figures and friends of the administration trying to work their way through this, um, I kept doing the little challenge in my head of defining it by what it isn't. And this, this is so broad that I can't tell you what integrated deterrence isn't. Um, because it's everything across every domain in every theater in every place. And that, again, seems to be just a description uh, of foreign policy. But again, I think this is this administration laying down a marker about not um, opposing our allies and comforting our enemies. And um, I suspect they were looking for language to do that. I think there is a bigger and more long-term Washington-oriented problem here, which is that I think each administration, because of the mandated existence of these documents, and I, I had to teach all these at the Naval War College for 25 years, um, and I was often um, walking into class and saying, the NSS, so what's up with that? Uh, you know, where we were sort of just kind of trying to figure out how to <clears throat> put forward what's in this NSS as opposed to the last NSS. And I think part of the problem is you end up noting primarily that these documents are ways for administrations to kind of mark their territory, to say this is our NDS and it might be a little bit different from the last one, but this is our approach to it. And that way we have, you know, we're doing something. Our NSS means something because we're not just kind of floating along. And I think um, particularly anybody who's worked with in a military environment can tell you that you don't just come in and say, everybody's doing a great job, don't change anything. It's always come in and say, you're all doing a great job, now here's the 10 things we're gonna change. And I think that's part of the problem and I think that leads to a certain amount of churn in these concepts. Um, but let's, I, let's applaud the idea that de integrated deterrence in this understanding uh, means not instantly threatening to create a wasteland, not falling back on the, I, I thought it was interesting, a likely pillar. Nuclear deterrence is a likely pillar of our, no, it's a pillar. It's there, it's still there. Um, I think when you have um, 1,500 nuclear warheads on station, it's a pillar of your national security policy. Um, but to say there are a whole a bunch of other things we can do, um, I think is an important reminder that we have other options besides that, that fallback. M my concern is that because this concept is very difficult to understand, um, one of the questions we were asking is who's the audience for this? I'm not sure. Um, I think there is an audience in the Washington policy community. In theory, the audience is our allies and enemies. I don't think our enemies are gonna, I, first of all, I don't think our allies are gonna be able to understand this very easily, but I certainly don't think our, our enemies are gonna take it very seriously. Um, integrated deterrence, I mean, Russia is in the middle of the biggest war in Europe since World War II. Um, and it seems like they are effectively deterred from attacking NATO by something that is not integrated, um, but pretty obvious. I mean, I think it's been remarkable. I was, I was deeply concerned 
about this conflict getting out of hand and going to a nuclear crisis, particularly in the first month when the Russians were, in, were just um, screwing up left and right. I mean, I'm, I studied the Russian and Soviet militaries my whole life, and I just, I am gobsmacked at the incredible incompetence and, and staggering um, um, inability of this of the Russian military in this situation, and I was very concerned that they were going to reach for um, some other solution here, including widening the conflict to NATO. They haven't done that, and I think that that's not because of integrated deterrence. I think that's because of deterrence deterrence, um, and so that might be a lesson <clears throat> for us to deal with. As for a deterrence, uh, before I go to a deterrence failure, I just want to point out that I went and found, um, this was uh, Charlie Dunlop's uh, shop down at Duke, and he'd asked somebody to write about integrated deterrence, and so what we got was a lot of this, um, you know, with PowerPoints and circles and things that were overlapping, which to me is basically creating or describing a strategy by playing with Legos. Um, and and I, I printed these out because I've been staring at them hoping that they, um, that, you know, like a, um, like one of those color tests that the, that the message, you know, come, but I'm, I'm colorblind. Um, so, you know, I never see the little 32 they put in the middle of all the color dots and I can't, I still can't see it here. But let's talk about the really scary part for a minute and then I will um, we'll move on to our, um, my colleagues. Um, what do we do in case of a deterrence failure? Well, the first thing I ask about this is, what does that nuclear deterrence failure look like? Because there is no such thing as a generic nuclear deterrence failure. <clears throat> Will the Russians resort to the use of nuclear weapons to do what? Will Putin explode a nuclear weapon over the Black Sea to be demonstrative and shake up NATO with no casualties and nothing, no, nothing hurt but fish? Um, will he try to use a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine in some kind of um, tactical or operational mode, unlikely. He knows which way the wind blows. Will he try to widen the war with some kind of tactical use of a nuclear weapon or the use of conventional weapons that carries the high risk of nuclear use by trying to widen the war to NATO? I, I don't know. And I think President Biden took some static and I think unfairly when he was asked this question, and he said, uh, he said basically, well, it depends on what they do, which I think was exactly the right answer for a president to say, instead of saying, well, let me just spin out a bunch of hypotheticals about nuclear weapons and tell you what I would do, which is exactly what you never want the president of the United States to do in public. Um, for myself, um, I am pretty hardcore about the idea that you do not reestablish the impermissibility of nuclear weapons by reciprocally using nuclear weapons. Um, and I'm heartened to, to hear that at least the initial administration work on this, in, as far as we know, in an unclass mode, is that um, they're thinking about really strong conventional responses uh, or conventional retaliation in some way should there be some kind of failure or some kind of Russian move toward um, tactical nuclear weapons. I'll end with a, a quote from 40 years ago that haunts me every time we talk about these things and something that I always throw when I used to work for the Navy and I would throw at my wargaming brother and, brothers and sisters. And it's um, from Michael Howard in 1981 uh, when he was writing about nuclear war and international security. When I read the flood of scenarios in strategic journals about first strike capabilities, counterforce or countervailing strategies, flexible response, escalation dominance, and the rest of the postulates of nuclear theology, I ask myself in bewilderment, this war they are describing, what is it about? The defense of Western Europe? Access to the Gulf? The protection of Japan? If so, why is the goal not mentioned, and why is the strategy not related to the progress of the conflict in these regions? But if it is not related to this kind of specific object, what are we talking about? And I think if we're going to talk about things like deterrence failures in, uh, in Central Europe, then we have to be very specific, and, and we have to get away from, I think, something that has become a problem for us, for the United States in particular, over the past 30 years, um, which is that this allergy to scenario planning 
um, and to come back to it and say, if we're going to talk about these things, we need to be very specific about what we're talking about. We need to be, as I argued in the piece this month that you can find in the Atlantic, we need to be very serious about what we're thinking through about the consequences, about what it would actually look like to use nuclear weapons and have them used against us, because I think we have, I think we've lost that, and I think we've forgotten it. Um, and it's perhaps not an, uh, an engaged and educated audience like this, but I think most Americans have simply inserted nuclear weapons as a kind of dummy variable that balances out all security problems without really thinking through Michael Howard's warning. What is this about and what price are we prepared to pay for it? Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Dr. Petty John, do you want to go up there? Do you want to sit there? I'm going to be you lazy and sit down. Fantastic. Um, uh, so break break from the norm and try to react a bit to some of the ideas that Tom put out. I figured if we all responded directly to the prompts that we might be saying similar things, so I'm going to try to be a little bit more agile. Um, I do agree with Tom on integrated deterrence that I think it's an effort at rebranding and um, establishing a you know, Biden administration brand and sort of uh, title for the national defense strategy, which we're all waiting for with bated breath. Um, and it is a corrective attempt to reassure allies that they're important and that we are going to be there, we value them, that it's a two-way partnership, they're a key advantage um, and an asymmetric one that we realize a lot of potential rivals do not have. But while it's attempting to do these things, I'm not sure it's actually succeeding. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, good intent behind the idea. Um, and that uh, in the end, though, as Tom pointed out, it's sort of everything, which means it's non-falsifiable and it doesn't really mean anything to anyone. And what it's leading to right now, and this might change when the strategy is actually released and folks can read it and understand all of the details, but is confusion and a little bit of concern. Um, because it is trying to integrate across domains, it sounds a lot like uh, joint all domain command and control or all domain operations, which um, is a evolving Pentagon effort to regain uh, the conventional military edge by leveraging and bringing together um, all of domains and connecting all of its different sensors and forces and using non-kinetic effects and new ways to allow it to um, defeat adversaries that have sophisticated anti-access air denial networks. Um, okay, so that's one thing. Then they're talking about across theaters. I'm not sure if this is uh, the uh, sort of heritage of the global integration and the effort that you had from the joint staff where you're trying to more flexibly use the capabilities that uh, the U.S. has in different theaters. They're not just earmarked for Europe. They can go from Europe to the Indo-Pacific if needed, which is true. Um, but uh, that may not be what it means either. It's sort of unclear. And that sounds like a, a bit more of the dynamic or uh, dynamic force employment, that was another one of the great jargony terms where, you know, we're going to be everywhere and we're going to surprise you, it's going to be unpredictable, but we plan it two years in advance. Um, <laughs> and then, but that could also mean horizontal escalation. Maybe we've realized that going into the teeth of the Chinese systems and trying to defeat them head on, defending Taiwan directly or in the South China Sea or in the East China Sea is not the right way. It's too hard. We can't do it. Um, and that our, our winning strategy is to escalate in another theater and to go after something that they care about, or maybe to go after uh, them through uh, different means economically, like uh, you've seen with the sanctions against Russia. The spectrum of conflict, I think this is just, um, you know, there's a realization that uh, things are not as black and white as sometimes Americans would like to prefer in certain American military planners. I do think, though, when we're talking about the spectrum of conflict, folks tend to be focusing on the middle to the lower end, and uh, that the idea of nuclear use, which is something we absolutely don't want to see happen, but we have to think about it happening to make sure that we can prevent it from happening, and that they're not really um, thinking about it as holistically as one would hope. So right now, um, the reason that I think there's a little bit of confusion is 
Uh, you have all of these different terms uh, targeting your allies, different adversaries across the board. And that really you have to think about deterrence in terms of deterring who from doing what. It has to be very specific and it needs to be tailored. And what we're missing right now is the fact that the theories of deterrence are unclear and the linkages, the intervening variables, how you are going to have the capability and the capacity and make your threat credible in these different situations is very blurred. One of the virtues of the 2018 NDS from my uh, perspective was that it was, well, A, it made choices, it prioritized, which is something that's very hard for bureaucracies to do, but it um, focused on deterrence by denial. It said specifically, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna defeat you conventionally. We're not gonna allow you to achieve your objective, whether that's Russia attacking NATO and the Baltic states or Romania or uh, China attacking Taiwan. This is our metric. This is how we're going to uh, size our force, what we're going to build a force to do. It's focused on conventional denial, um, and we're going to figure out how to operate close in. And I've heard uh, Under Secretary Call say this too, that effective approaches to denial are the cornerstone of integrated deterrence. But at the same time that they say that and talk about being able to operate close into our adversaries um, and within sort of their weapons engagement zones, there are discussions about cost imposition, which I think is just a nice use, euphemism for punishment um, of various forms. And some of it might be economic, like the sanctions against Russia. But when you think about punishment strategies, you often also think about nuclear weapons. And that's not something I've heard anyone say. But it is a very different logic that you need to articulate um, to deter an adversary and to reassure your allies. What capabilities are they going to expect to see? What do they, um, what sort of posture do they expect? What is your diplomatic policy? So I think connecting these two so that you pair your different theories of deterrence, it doesn't mean that we're saying we're going to try to deny China and we realize we can't do two wars simultaneously, so we're going to rely on cost of position against Russia with whatever tools um, that seem to be effective at that time. That needs to be, I think, uh, pulled and uh, spelled out in more detail to actually make those uh, threats credible and clear so that there's not misunderstanding. And then at the same time, um, so our allies are reassured and understand that perhaps we're not going to have as many conventional forces in a region, but we're planning on protecting you another way. And I think that you know, direct deterrence, uh, deterrence of attacks on the U.S. homeland is still quite strong. It's our extended deterrent commitments that are the real challenge and the weak link right now, and what the United States needs to figure out how to um, sort of shore up. Um, turning to the last issue, nuclear use, which no one wants to see happen, and I don't think uh, most American military planners, despite what's happened in Ukraine, think is very likely. Um, and my concern is that the likelihood is actually growing due to changes in the international system, the, balance, the shifting balance of conventional and strategic power. Um, so we're seeing a number of different trends. Um, obviously, North Korea is now a nuclear armed state, um, and they, Kim Jong-un seems to be intent on um, using those, which is a traditional strategy of a weaker country. Um, so they, they might be deploying them actually to front, frontline troops along the DMZ, um, but I feel like crisis stability on the Korean Peninsula is not something that uh, gives me warm and fuzzies right now given South Korea's doctrine of, um, I forget what they changed the name to, massive punishment and retaliation and the kill chain. There's a lot of offensive minded uh, sort of thinking on both sides that worries me and there, I'm a fear there could be an inadvertent escalatory spiral. I think when uh, you look at what's happening with China, it's a different situation because China's growing conventionally. It's not clear it will ever pass the United States, um, but it is uh, certainly relatively uh, moving in the right direction, at least within East Asia. That shifts things. They're also developing a lot of strategic capabilities, nuclear capabilities in a way that is unprecedented for them. In some ways, that should be reassuring. We think about, all right, why did they have such a vulnerable deterrent to begin with? That was kind of aberrant and unusual. 
Um, so maybe this is actually crisis stabilizing, but then you have the flip side of that, which is the stability and stability paradox, and what I fear could be the lessons that are being drawn from Ukraine and what Putin has done with the brandishing of nuclear weapons, where it has very clearly set lines and kept the United States and NATO out of that conflict. Taiwan and Ukraine are very different in many different ways, but that doesn't mean that that isn't the lesson that's being learned, and that you know China could ultimately conclude that its um, winning counter-intervention strategy is uh, making nuclear threats at the front end and potentially using them. And then I don't think uh, we really know how we would respond. And I agree with Tom that um, most responses should be conventional. And we'd have to begin to start to think through in these different scenarios. Is this a demonstration shot? Does that even merit any sort of response? Can you just do this diplomatically and rhetorically and with economic sanctions? If it's a non-strategic nuclear weapon that's used against a military target, that's a different uh, uh, bucket versus you know using a strategic nuclear weapon or going after a civilian target. So um, I think these are all things that um, need to be seriously considered in order to make sure that we prevent them from happening going forward. On that heavy note, I'll end. Okay, Mr. Troy. Great. So I was tasked with uh, providing an ally perspective. Uh, coming from South Korea, being a recipient of U.S. extended turns and the U.S. nuclear umbrella, um, living in a multipolar nuclear world, and I was asked to focus on two questions. One being, what does integrated deterrence mean to me? And the second, how will U.S. allies in East Asia view integrated deterrence? So being the non-American, I will try to be more positive about this U.S. concept. Um, I do believe that it is problem-driven. And so my definition is that it is a concept that emphasizes more effectively coordinating various means or tools of power across domains, and you heard the definition that was cited before. More practically, I think it's an acknowledgement of an effort to overcome traditional stovepipes. So if we can all agree that no one really knows what integrated deterrence is or that it's everything, I think we can also agree that we suffer from stovepipes that stovepipes between agencies of government, allies, emerging technologies and legacy platforms, operational systems and capabilities of the military, and government responses in competition, crisis, and conflict. These are real problems, real challenges, that I do believe uh, the, uh, the Biden administration is genuinely trying to address. But simply, uh, integrated deterrence is an umbrella concept that proposes a different way to use all the tools we have or are now developing to realize a more effective deterrence posture. So what do U.S. allies in East Asia uh, view with regard to integrated deterrence? Well, generally as a concept, I would say that the perspective is that it's necessary and welcome, if not unsurprising. It is a requirement of today's geostrategic realities, Sino-U.S. competition in a post-Pax Americana era, a multipolar nuclear Indo-Pacific, an increasingly integrated global operational theater with the potential for inter- and intra-regional opportunistic aggression. It is welcome as a response to address adversaries that increasingly pose threats or challenges that are composed of coherent activities across regions, domains, and dimensions, leverage gray zone challenges and fatal complete strategies, and exploit variants within alliances for strategic decoupling effects. Finally, I think an ally perspective is that integrated deterrence is a natural evolution. It's a repackaging of multiple lines of effort that were already in play. On the US, things that come to mind are efforts related to the third offset, operating coordinated information campaigns through the Global Engagement Center, and the concept of the Constellation of Alliances. So again, these are efforts that existed both in Republican and Democratic administrations in the past, um, but that are being repackaged in a way to fit under this umbrella concept. When I look at the Japan-US alliance, uh, there were terms in the past of seamless deterrence. I, I hear more recently a reconceptualization by the Japanese of offense and defense with regard to the roles they play within the alliance. Uh, 
you look at capabilities development and Japan's investments in its military capabilities, as well as its growing global diplomatic role. For the ROC US alliance, the South Korean US alliance, I, I note the evolution of the terms consultative mechanisms and alliance postures evolving respectively to a two plus two format, as well as one in which South Korea provides the overwhelming majority of conventional forces and contributes to a combined alliance deterrent strategy. I, I observe updates to our operational plans that take into account the changing nuclear environment as well as the rise of China and major rock force developments, including non-nuclear strategic assets. Specifically though, as a Biden administration, ad, administration priority, I believe allies view integrated deterrence with confusion, hope, but are also a bit underwhelmed. The uncertainty, I think, deals with what it means for the US and extended deterrence. We hear the talking points by senior leaders. We hear the echoes throughout the government. And yet, we're still confused about implementation. I'm not sure if we can credit what we see the US government and military doing as operationalizing integrated deterrence. So the big question is, there's something new, or how do you operationalize it? Nevertheless, um, I think that there's still hope. Uh, allies see the, the problems and the challenges that I mentioned before, and hope that integrated deterrence will be the way that the US strengthens extended deterrence, and that we as allies realize uh, strength and collective deterrence posture. And here I see positive developments. Um, you see greater UK NATO focus in the Indo-Pacific. You have Indo-Pacific allies present at the NATO summit. You see exercises, not only the traditional RIMPAC, but large scale global exercises, red flag, talisman saber, which was run by the Australians. And then a movement of even this nebulous concept of JATSE2, moving to see JATSE2 to, in to include combined assets of, of allies. Um, we have South Korea and the Japanese, uh, LNOs at US STRATCOM, and increasingly I, I understand that they discuss the risk of strategic deterrence failure um, at a conceptual level. For the ROC in US, uh, in the most recent presidential summit, President Biden has committed to new and additional steps. And for me, I took that line with a lot of hope because I don't think traditional U.S. approaches to extended deterrence uh, will continue to meet the requirements based on the changes in the geostrategic environment and the threats that we face. My hope is that with the Biden administration, particularly with deterrence, we don't build back better, but that we build back differently because I do believe that we need to be transformative. Between South Korea and the US, we've also agreed to update our O plans again with strategic policy guidance and strategic policy directives that address the evolving North Korean nuclear threat in China. Um, South Korea has announced its plans to establish a South Korean STRATCOM, um, which would focus components of our military on deterrence, um, but try to achieve non-nuclear strategic deterrence, so as not to worry anyone in this room, who again, I'm sure have seen polls about public support regarding ROC indigenous armament. Finally, you also see movement on ally industry sides. So South Korea announced major sales to Turkey. Uh, it's offered uh, a submarine capability to fill the gap with regard to Australia's maritime force. It's developing uh, fighter jets with Indonesia and trying to strengthen defense cooperation with Southeast Asia. And then you see major investments by private companies in the economic security of the United States and the Alliance uh, with regard to semiconductors. On the US side, again, as I mentioned before, the movement from JATC2 to CJATC2 and, and at least a hand wave or a mention of trying to build an open architecture 
in which allies are able to plug, plug and play their assets into the U.S. platform. And statements coming out of uh, General Milley about modernizing our militaries collectively uh, from Admiral Richards, noting that strategic and conventional forces are linked and 21st century deterrence requires greater levels of enterprise-wide engagement. Again, th this is reassuring. This provides me hope because it does address concerns that I had about stovepipes. Yet there's also skepticism. Uh, amongst allies about how integrated deterrence is manifesting and whether it is possible. You know, I think the, perhaps the greatest achievement or uh, example of forward movement on integrated deterrence might be AUKUS. And yet, from an East Asian ally perspective, I see that as an Anglo-Saxon alliance that is offered uh, progress and developments and cooperation that despite living in your priority theater and next to your pacing threat, uh, we are still denied. And so it's not a secret that South Korea has requested nuclear propulsion submarines, um, but we're denied that. Uh, when I look at the, even the bottom half of the AUKUS fact sheet, that does not focus on nuclear propulsion submarines, but non-nuclear strategic cooperation. Those are also areas that I think East Asian allies would like greater cooperation with the United States to realize integrated deterrence. And when I look at AUKUS language, the move from interoperable to integrated and now interchangeable, I wonder if East Asian allies and the United States can realize that level, that degree, of integration. From South Korea's perspective, I look at the strategic documents that were mentioned as very beautiful prose where you say the right things, but as mentioned before, I'm not exactly sure I see the actions. You know, there's talk about NATO in the Indo-Pacific, but there's a different way of how certain Koreans define NATO, and that's no action, talk only. And so, despite all this mentioning of re reinvigorating consultative dialogue mechanisms between South Korea and the U.S., which I think in the past helped advance our combined deterrence posture, talk is not enough anymore. And I also am uncertain whether or not the NATO model with nuclear sharing is also appropriate for the Indo-Pacific theater. But what concerns me is that even when we've agreed to revitalize our consultative mechanisms, before we've even started consultations, we've taken agenda items off the table. So the Biden administration very um, early messaged to the Union administration, or South Korea, that it would not want to entertain the redeployment of tactical nuclear weapons um, or nuclear sharing. And the Union administration, which originally had some of these ideas uh, during the campaign, quickly took it off. I think both sides um, are focused, and understandably so, on prioritizing alliance atmospherics. But they're doing so by assuming risk to the alliance deterrence posture. I think we need to get to a point where we actually have all options on the table with regard to the nuclear umbrella and extended deterrence and then as allies discuss the reasons to take off or to substitute for these options to realize deterrent effects. Even, but I, I wanna be fair, developments on the US side have not just been pros, right? In, in, during the Trump administration, uh, you started development and fielding of low yield uh, summary launch ballistic missiles as well as gravity bombs that filled the gap that I believe South Koreans and the Japanese saw with regard to proportional nuclear response in theater. Despite that, I'm unaware of how much we've really prepared our conventional forces currently deployed, how we've really trained up South Korean forces that would be on the ground if the U.S. had to use those low-yield nuclear weapons. And if we really haven't trained up our partners 
for U.S. low-yield nuclear use, then does that, does that not chip away at the credibility of use as well as the deterrent effect? Finally, I wonder, because of variance in perceptions and strategies, whether or not we can ever realize integrated turns. And what I mean by that is that I agree that as allies, we, we generally um, have consensus on our ends or our objectives, but we often disagree on ways and means. And I think that we have to be honest with ourselves about when we just need to be aligned and when we should really seek integration. One example of this is the U.S. use uh, and designation of tactical versus strategic nuclear weapons. When you discuss tactical and strategic nuclear weapons, what I hear is, okay, so if it's a weapon that's aimed at the U.S. homeland, it's strategic. If it's something that goes off in theater on pen, it's tactical. For South Koreans that live on Penn in a very small geography, there are no tactical nuclear weapons. There are low yield strategic weapons. And they would cause huge devastation. And that highlights and underscores the difference between our two defense strategies. The United States, Australia, maybe even Japan have a defend forward strategy. South Korea, we don't have a forward. We are forward. And so I wonder when you subset your deterrent strategy underneath your broader defense strategy, whether or not you could really get integration. Then the two-war doctrine, victory in one theater versus suppression in another. I mean, people have criticized uh, Russians' operational failures and praised Ukraine's operational victories, but if we look at what operational victory is in Ukraine, it's absolute devastation. It's horrific. It's war crimes. It's death. And that's the difference of being on the ground, forward deployed, and living at the front line, vice extended turns from a distance. In this way, I, I think that the alliance needs to evolve to strategic autonomy with alliance as strategic redundancy, which is much more advers adversary focus versus just increased burden sharing with dependency and alliance control through integration. For the longest time in the U.S.-South Korean alliance, integration was a, was a taboo word. We could accept interoperability, but integration meant U.S. continuing control, constraining rock responses when we felt we needed to in order to reestablish deterrence or break a cycle of provocations. Ultimately, it comes down to, I think, alliance management, confidence building, um, building on and breaking from legacy approaches to deterrence within the alliance, acknowledging differences and limitations, even in the U.S. nuclear posture that on surface value may cause concern, but I think in the longer term would actually raise the credibility of the U.S. nuclear umbrella. And with that, I'll... Well, thank you to all of you for your extremely thought-provoking comments this morning. Um, I guess I don't need any more coffee after some of those uh, points that were made. Um, a couple of themes that I heard uh, the panel express um, that I thought were quite interesting. Uh, one is that the audience for uh, for the term integrated deterrence actually seems to primarily be Washington. Um, and, and I'm reminded of our, you know, a few years ago when we were talking, or in Afghanistan and Iraq, we were, everything was partnerships. Every, and so everything seems to be coming, becoming integrated deterrence in the same way. Is this about budget justifications? And, 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 or is this about strategy? And how do we parse out the two is, is a big question. Mr. Choi mentioned this question of stovepipes and how integrated deterrence can help us understand that we need to break through those. And again, 
We've been studying this problem for decades about our organizational stovepipes in the national security system. I think we could probably fill a Walmart with the number of studies we've done on um, interagency reform, Goldwater Nichols for the interagency, those sorts of things. So it's an enduring problem, but we still haven't actually addressed it or certain, certainly apparently not sufficient to um, deal with the challenges that we're, we're seeing today. And so we, we have this term, it integrated deterrence, apparently to help us get through that. Um, I'm also hearing from the panel that what we need is less the taglines and much more the, the a necessity for the detailed planning, the detailed exercising. There's a hunger for the how, the ways and means, and that's how we'll start understanding what integrated deterrence is and how we can move forward in our posture and with our allies and partners. Um, so I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and ask the first couple of questions um, based on this conversation, but I do want to remind you all that you have index cards in your folders if you want to write out your questions and hold them up. One of our, uh, the Project on Nuclear Issues team will come and collect them and then hand them up to me. Um, also, if you're online and watching this, please put your questions in the chat box and again, we'll get those questions up to the panel, um, which as a I, I think we can all anticipate is going to be a lively exchange after the, the presentations we just had. Um, so, so again, returning to this question of what is integrated deterrence and, and, and the confusion over the phrase, um, and, and this, this, this desire for the, the how, the ways, the means, um, what do you think should be the priority task or or priority task. What kinds of activities, priorities, initiatives, acquisitions, et cetera, do you think need to be prioritized as in, in operationalizing what integrated deterrence should mean to you? And that's for all the entire panel. Okay. Whoever, whoever wants to jump, jump in Great. first. Um, is that, there we go. Um, well, I think um, it's, uh, it's been said and thrown at me in other fora, um, nuclear doves are conventional hawks. Um, and I think if we're going to integrate deterrence, um, I, like Stacy, I, my, my eyes kind of glaze over at multi-domain, multi-theater, multi, you know, joint this, joint that. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, a more integrated, deter and this is going to sound like the old Cold War uh, argument, and I, I've spent 20 years arguing against returning to the Cold War, but um, Vladimir Putin has talked me out of that. Um, to say that we have to stop neglecting the conventional side of our um, deterrent, especially since in a place like Europe, um, we are the superior conventional power. I mean, the script has been flipped on us from the Cold War days. We're now the superior conventional power that has to deal with the possibility that our weaker conventional foe might want to resort to nuclear weapons to, to scramble the deck. Of course, we, we kept that um, possibility open for ourselves because we would assumed we would be the defender against an aggressor. This is really interesting that a conventionally weaker aggressor and poten potentially in both Asia uh, in the Pacific and in Europe, potentially weaker conventional aggressors are holding back nuclear weapons as their trump card um, in a way that um, we did, were not able to and, and didn't envision doing during the Cold War in NATO. But I think the answer to that is to close off, um, and I, I think that um, uh, Stacy was the one who brought up um, denial, you know, close off the options for rapid conventional victories. Um, one of the reasons I think that NATO strategy was so effective toward the end of the Cold War is that it had, in a very patient way, you could almost say it was an integrated deterrent, where it had closed off all Soviet options for any kind of aggression in the European theater at the conventional level and at the nuclear level and at the theater level and so on. So I, I, I won't, I'll just say that when I think of integrated, I would like to see 
somehow the conventional side of this brought back. But of course, Americans hate, the American political establishment especially, hates talking about this because it's expensive and it's mostly the expense of human beings. I mean, you just need more people in the Navy um, to solve these operational tempo problems and so on. And I'll add just one um, uh, slight objection to something uh, Paul brought up. I, I don't think that the submarine launched tactical nuclear missiles that Biden has since canceled. I don't think that filled anything except a particular itch among a certain group in Washington who just wanted to renuclearize Europe in some way by building more nuclear weapons. Because for a certain group, the answer is always build more nuclear weapons. And I don't, I don't think there was very much strategic sense behind that program at all, other than um, as part of the kind of ongoing hatred to the INF treaty um, in Europe that you know was like we were going to outdo the Russians in hating on the INF treaty. So that's what I think. <laughs> Dr. Pettyjohn? Um, I, I agree with Tom again, and I, I do think conventional deterrence needs to be strengthened. And you know, um, there's been a lot of admiring the problem for a long time and watching the problem get worse, at least in the Indo-Pacific, and not making the necessary changes, um, which sometimes are going to be somewhat painful because I don't think it is just more of the same that is the right answer. And I think there has to be serious thinking about how you manage risk across time and strength and deterrence in the near term while you wait for some of the really advanced technologies that the department seems to be betting on to mature and actually um, produce capabilities that can be employed. Um, in addition to strengthening um, the U.S.'s ability to deny an aggressor their objective, I think that um, nuclear deterrence needs to be uh, become a core part of deterrent thinking. That doesn't mean that we're planning to employ or even threaten to employ, but siloing it off, keeping it in the stovepipe, um, is, uh, I think, um, foolish and something that could lead to very terrible consequences. So um, that just having a strong triad that might be necessary for strategic deterrence, but it doesn't ensure that nuclear weapons aren't employed, and that we need to really be thinking about the risks and the different scenarios and use cases and considering how to deter those ahead of time, how to manage risk, um, how to manage escalation so that we don't inadvertently stumble into a situation that um, quickly escalates vertically and in ways that would be terrible. I do, I think, disagree a little bit. I think that uh, right now our strategic deterrent is a credible threat for attacks on the U.S. I don't know about allies. And I, considering what the answer is, I, I don't have a prejudged one. But thinking through in these different circumstances what might be needed uh, is important. And at least asking the questions, trying to do the analysis, and understanding what some of the options might be. Um, and it m might not be anything new. It might be that you do need something that is is more proportional to make it a credible threat because no one could ever imagine the U.S. using um, a, an ICBM um, in response to a non-strategic nuclear weapon. Um, though I take your point, I think you're right about the the language is totally off uh, today and and should be revised. And I think um, uh, new new words need to be developed and uh, categories that are more applicable to the situation that we face. Mr. Choi? Although I do, as a hardcore NATO nerd for my entire career, not another talking organization. Oh, it breaks my heart. <laughs> Sorry, over to you. So to be clear, I'm, I'm not advocating yet that South Korea uh, pursues an indigenous nuclear capability especially given the enduring and unique situation on the Korean Peninsula with regarding um, my country being divided and the political objective uh, of unification. In which case, I'm uncertain even if North Korea were to use nuclear weapons, whether or not South Korea would want to use nuclear weapons. I think it would complicate operations with regard to us moving north. 
And also, given the high threshold for actual nuclear use with regard to the role that it plays in deterrence, it might confuse adversaries' calculus, but returning more to the focused question, I think we really need to explore whether or not you can have non-nuclear strategic deterrence, whether or not you can use conventional, modern conventional assets to deter a nuclear adversary. Um, I also think that as allies start to build up that capacity, that the U.S. be forward-leaning rather than constraining with regard to conventional buildup by allies. You know, there's, there was a debate in Washington about an arms race between South Korea and North Korea. And that's because you separate nuclear and conventional. If you live against a nuclear threat, I don't, I don't separate it. They are our nuclear power. I don't care if they're conventionally inferior. They have those nukes to use against us. And so the fact that South Korea remains a conventional military, I don't care how much we raise that threshold of payload on those conventional missiles, if we try to pursue a survivable second strike to submarine-launched ballistic missiles, that is the testimony to our commitment to the non-proliferation regime, despite the nuclear region that we live in. And so I think it is the responsibility of alliance managers to really push that raw conventional threshold empower, inform, inspire, and work with South Korea in standing up this ROC STRATCOM using conventional assets, as well as start really opening, opening up about how we would operationalize the nuclear umbrella and the security guarantees that the U.S. provides at that nuclear threshold to South Korea. Um, so those two lines of efforts is how okay. I, okay. I would suggest we pursue integrated deterrence. Thank you. Um, another question for all panelists. Um, if, if deterrence is a, is a mechanism for communicating intent, how do we tailor integrated deterrence? And, I mean, during the Cold War, we were arguably signaling towards one adversary, Moscow. How do, how do we have a deterrent posture that communicates intent to a variety of actors? How do we tailor integrated deterrence? Who wants to jump in first? <laughs> I'll take a hack. I don't think I have a good answer. Um, I think it's incredibly difficult. Um, and, you know, there's an entire literature on misperception, miscommunication, and that was all based on sort of the Cold War bipolar environment where you knew who your adversary was and knew who you were trying to send that signal to. And I think when you have multiple adversaries in different directions and every state is looking in those different directions simultaneously and thinking about um, uh, potentially uh, a couple of different opponents that um, further complicates your ability to clearly signal and message, which um, it's not clear we ever actually do a very good job of message sending the messages and that they're received because everyone has very different uh, perceptions of the situation. So when you look at the overlapping security dilemmas that China faces, right, it's looking south, it's looking at India, it might be a little bit worried about North Korea, probably Russia a little bit, the United States, the US is thinking about Russia and China and North Korea, and then you have India looking at China and Pakistan, and it's, it's very uh, complicated and potentially uh, prone to confusion, which um, I think makes tailoring it very, very difficult. And um, one of the concerns that I have bringing it back to the defense strategy and integrated deterrence is that they haven't been able to articulate it in a way to different allies who face completely different security situations and needs and that until we're able to do so um, that it, it's probably not going to um, be particularly effective or useful anybody else want to take a whack at it i would say two lines of effort one is uh, greater cross-pollination and, and regional expertise 
Uh, so greater cross-pollination between regional experts and functional experts here in the U.S. system. I think Korea, we lack functional experts in deterrence. And so we need to build up that capacity. Um, I think th that's how we get to better understanding adversaries. And the second line of effort that I think is critical um, is really having hard discussions about the need to assume risk. As U.S. ally, I feel that the United States has an aversion to risk that adversaries often exploit. And obviously deterrence is a game of risk. I, not to belittle it by the use of the term game, but um, with regard to escalation concerns, sometimes we need to escalate. We need to show our uh, will to do so in order to manage escalation. And oftentimes, I don't see that risk acceptance um, in our deterrence posture to make it effective. I'm going to um, just throw something out quickly um, that's a little uncomfortable to say in the home of some of the world's most uh, foremost defense intellectuals. When I hear a question like tailoring integrated deterrence, I wonder if we're overthinking this. Um, that it, you know, that the task of foreign policy is to communicate to friends and, and opponents, here are our core interests, here are the things that are important to the United States, here are some things that will provoke us to use, without being specific, some of the many instruments at our disposal. This is where the integration comes in. Um, and all of them are quite powerful um, and so you are better off talking with us about those core interests rather than, you know, I mean, when I hear Taylor deterrence, I always think of um, how we were trying to pressure the Kim 2.0 2 regime, the, fa the, the um, Kim uh, Jong, right, I, uh, <laughs> Kim Jong-un's dad, um, <laughs> by, by um, embargoing things like Rolex watches. Right? We wanted to take away stuff that he could reward um, the regime. Ro I think we did luxury cars, Courvoisier, Rolex watches. You know, did that work? Was that a good idea? Or, you know, did it, did it work simply to say, look, the, the, defense, the freedom of South Korea is a core interest in the United States. And that, is, that needs for you to be clearly understood. We have a large array of things, um, and I agree with you that we, we don't spend enough time, you know, anymore talking about how we would do this and prepare for it, which is part of deterrence itself. I mean, when I teach nuclear um, stuff, uh, when I was teaching nuclear strategy, and, you know, my students say, why do we tell them what our war plans are? Why were we, why was all this unclassified? I was like, because we want them to know it. We want them to know that we are prepared, that we have forward defense and damage limitation and you know all of this stuff, because that's c communicating to them that we are capable of doing, it's like, it's like having a gun for protection and showing your neighbors that you're going to the range every day and say, I'm really good with this. Um, so I, I just worry that we're overthinking it and because too many of us are working on it and trying to get it down to some, you know, micromillimeter calibrated notion of deterrence that won't mean anything to most of our adversaries in the world. So every, Paul keeps trying to be optimistic, and I keep raining on the parade, so I'll stop. <laughs> if, if I could jump in Please. just on a two finger on that point, you know, I agree. I think overly tailoring things, this fundamentally is about, um, you know, being able to deny or hurt. Uh, one way or the other. But at the same time, we don't have the overwhelming conventional capability that we can do all of it at the same time. So, and that's apparent to people, um, I think adversaries and allies. So it does have to mean that we need to be a little bit more thoughtful um, in terms of making threats that are credible, that we're willing to follow through, recognizing that we have to sort of conserve uh, some of our capabilities because we can't do it all anymore. Or, or to build up, yep, or, or, to, or to build up our conventional forces, 
which is that you know what we keep putting ourselves in this box of well because we don't have enough conventional capability we have to, we have to think about these non-strategic nuclear weapons the whole point of having an effective conventional military is so that you're not constantly being forced to retreat to and then when i can't do this other stuff um you know what do i end up relying on so i i, I guess what i'm saying is i'm in heated agreement with you but i think the answer is um stronger conventional forces and more capability that way Jump on in. <laughs> I, I'm jumping because, you know, I'm going to support both tailored deterrence and integrated deterrence with this comment. And that's this. It's, well, we have to figure out what adversaries value, right? And even in our approach to responses and proportionality in a, in a singular domain, that makes no sense for them because they don't proportionally value the lives of their citizens, right? So. But to the, to the point of integrated terms and working across domains, maybe they do value information control. And instead of conventional kinetic, we do an information campaign. We, instead of lighting up with artillery, we respond with lighting up their populations with internet access. That is why tailoring deterrence, our responses, knowing what adversaries value, matter. And that's why we need that expertise. That's a fascinating exchange. Thank you. Um, so the next question, uh, this is from the audience. Uh, Putin's nuclear threats throughout the course of his invasion of Ukraine has reintroduced nuclear dynamics um, to the American public after a long period of, uh, quote unquote, nuclear amnesia that characterized the post-Cold War era. In the context of the Biden administration's approach to nuclear threats, how does the U.S. and its allies inform and prepare their publics for these dynamics? Um, I'm going to jump on that because, and also uh, use that as a moment of shameless self-promotion to say this is what I wrote about in this month's um, Atlantic on sale now wherever quality magazines are found. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And um, I think that we have not had, for a long time, an honest discussion with ourselves about what nuclear deterrence entails. And the, the proof of this, and part of the reason I wrote this kind of creed occur um, in the Atlantic, was that um, I was stunned at how many people, and people I think should know better, said things at the outset of the Ukrainian war like, let's start blasting Russian artillery positions with NATO jets. Now, maybe I'm just old. You know, again, I, I can't stood up here and said, I came here in 1985 in the Soviet project. Um, maybe I'm just old. NATO jets blasting the, the bejeebers out of Russian artillery in the middle of Europe is the thing I spent most of my life trying to prevent and don't want to see. Um, and yet I think so many people said, what, oh, what different, it's just, he'll make empty threats. Um, you know, we, I think we've had 30 years of being, of the United States since the end of the Cold War, being so supremely powerful uh, and without a real sense of that Cold War threat that we just think we can control the course of events. We'll just blast their stuff, they'll back down, they'll understand. There's no sense in here that there are just huge, Paul, you brought up a risk. I mean, it's one thing to run risk. It's another thing to walk into a casino with, you know, money hanging out of your pockets and sucker tattooed on your forehead and say, you know, where's the, you know, where's the, where's the dice? Um, and I think that's what people were really advocating here. And I think it was really, I think the smartest thing Joe Biden did was when Putin raised his nuclear alert, which it turns out didn't, as far as we could tell, right, uh, open source, no one could see any change in the status of Russian nuclear forces. And to their credit, the Biden administration just went, meh, he does what he does. You know, that's, you know, that's him. But we did not go tit for tat and raise, I mean, that could have been the beginning of an incredibly dangerous m moment when the United States says, well, that's what our increased status alert for, and we're gonna start putting, moving people around and putting nuclear forces on alert. Um, so I think it's not just the Biden administration. All of us who are involved in this enterprise need to talk to our fellow citizens and say, look, there are times to risk terrible things. But before you do that, you really need to know what you're talking about and what you're thinking about and what it would look like for you and for your country. And um, I, 
uncharacteristically, um, that has let people, I've, I've taken, I'm, I, I was a young Reaganite when I came to CSIS, and I've had people telling me what a coward I am and how afraid I am of, of, the, of the Kremlin. And I'm not afraid of the Kremlin, I'm afraid of uncertainty. I'm afraid of people taking risks that they don't understand. I'm afraid of Putin taking risks that he can't control, because one thing we've now learned about Vladimir Putin is that he is a terrible strategist. I mean, I hope we can finally, this war deflates the idea that Vladimir Putin is this brilliant chess playing, ice cold spy man. He's a volatile, emotional, vain, not very bright gangster who has a lot of nuclear weapons and an army under his control. And when you think about dealing with him, you know, try to understand that he might take risks that he doesn't understand that might go to places that even he doesn't want to go. And instead, this has been absent, I would argue, from our discussion, particularly in, this, in the first few months of the Ukraine war, where there were prominent people, well-meaning people, getting out there and saying, it's time to, you know, put the screws to the Russian military and start blowing them out of their trenches and attacking Russian targets. And I, I just, I, I, I'm sorry, I will get off this rant, but um, I really think that we have, I, I, I think we need a little bit of a dose of the old Cold War medicine to remind us what exactly it is we're talking about when we talk about these things in, in uh, Central Europe and in Asia when we're talking about um, opposing the Chinese. I'm in violent agreement um, in terms of understanding the risks and the lack of doing so. The last 30 years of and the end of the Cold War where we've faced um, lesser opponents that don't have the capability to hurt us, to reach out and really touch the United States in a significant way outside of asymmetric attacks like terrorist attacks. Um, that uh, we have forgotten um, that we cannot just do what we want. And there are a lot of euphemisms for war, like no-fly zones, that are really uh, about, um, but, you know, shooting down Russian planes or air defenses that fire at you. And should you make that choice, know that you're making that choice and that's what it is, not pretend that it's something that it's not. I also, though, agree with Paul and the idea that um, uh, Sometimes we might have to take risks. We just have to be very clear about where that is and understand what we're doing in that moment and not um, sort of stumble into it thinking that we're going to come out unscathed. The only comment I'd like to add is that um, I think the U.S. should be very clear about why it did and did not do certain things in response to that nuclear threat. And I don't think that that is even though it is open source, that message, that narrative was as pervasively explained. And so for those who do um, receive US security guarantees and don't hear that about uh, the Biden administration not having seen changes in Russia's nuclear forces and that you know, being a factor in how the administration responded, has a huge um, influence on the way we interpret the ways e events unfolded. Interesting. Another question from the audience. Um, what are specific conventional force changes you'd like to see in the Indo-Pacific to strengthen deterrence? Is there a role you'd like to see for theater nuclear weapons um, to play in this? <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I think it depends which uh, potential adversary you're looking at. Um, on the Korean Peninsula, the South Koreans have, uh, you know, most of the conventional capability today, um, the U.S. is sort of in a assisting role in terms of providing uh, more long-range strike capabilities, some ground-based fires that are farther, but um, I don't actually think there's as much uh, conventionally needed there as much as thinking through the changing scenarios and talking about what might be considered to be done under different circumstances and considering how you're going to respond to the fact that it looks like Kim Jong-un will uh, brandish nuclear weapons and is developing much better uh, missiles than he used to have, uh, which is pretty alarming. Uh, on the, if you're thinking about China, um, in the near term, I mean, part of the problem is we can't, we're not good at 
uh, fielding things quickly, but some of it are things we've seen in Russia, munitions, right? Enough of the right munitions of different types that um, uh, allow you to stand outside of the worst threat ring. Um, you want more submarines, you need to make your sort of posture more resilient so that you can absorb an attack were it to come in and survive. Um, they're not necessarily um, the most glamorous or exciting of new weapons. I'm not just talking about you know drones and AI, though that is sort of the future vision that the Pentagon seems to be moving towards. There's a lot of um, more mundane things about logistics and uh, having prepositioned stockpiles of equipment uh, that are really, really important and would do a lot to shore up uh, the U.S. position in that theater. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I had jet lag for that moment. You read that question. So could you, could you repeat it? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, oh, and I feel that. <laughs> the, the jet lag. We all feel that, don't we? Um, from an allied perspective, is it, no. I've got, no, I'm actually going to change. What, 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 would, um, what, what did you want to say? Uh, my, my, I came down from Providence, so I only have a little bit of jet lag. Um, but uh, what would you want to see as conventional improvements in the Asia Pacific theater? And is there any role for theater nuclear weapons That's correct. in that, which after you describe that, I have a word or two about theater nuclear weapons. Thank you. I think on the peninsula, we need an honest discussion about prepositioned stockpiles not only for North Korea, but for China as well. I think the reality is um, that while South Korea has built up its conventional capabilities for omnidirectional threats, which is a euphemism for more than just North Korea, uh, you know, the China challenge is absolutely different. And I also believe that U.S. forces in Korea, um, because of alliance constraints, have not been able to set the force in ways that uh, are prepared for such contingencies. Um, and given A2AD and the importance of having uh, forces ready during crisis, I think that's important. Uh, with regard to in-theater uh, low-yield nuclear weapons, um, I, I think it's important to have the presence of that US, nu U.S. nuclear umbrella for prompt response um, for different contingencies. I do think that uh, they did fill a gap, the Trump administration, and that um, those capabilities also were a reflection of concerns that allies expressed to the United States. Um, it's going to sound like this is just me um, after 25 years at the Naval War College advocating for big navies. That's not actually um, why I was not um, a huge, I was not um, tattooed with maritime power um, by teaching at the Naval War College. Although I will say when I was here at CSIS during the Cold War, the Soviet Union published a description of CSIS that said that our biggest task at CSIS was that we were committed to the um, principle of American maritime supremacy around the world. I never understood that. I didn't know anybody at CSIS who did that. Um, but that's the way the Soviets saw it. Um, I think um, there's a one simple answer is that the Navy has to be staffed and, and equipped um, at for, just we just need a, a bigger Navy in the Pacific and also with the people who can crew those um, ships um, you know and maintain they're, 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 the Navy's worn out by its operational tempo that's just the reality and again why don't we want to do it because people are expensive ships are expensive we keep looking for the shortcuts and the quick fixes to a lot of our security dilemmas um, in, in both regions but I want to say a word about theater nuclear weapons because um, it, again, it really bothers me that somehow after uh, everything, the, this terrifying interlude we went through with theater nuclear weapons in Europe, we're all, we're all thinking about it again. Like, wouldn't this be 
a great solution. It's like the it's like um, the movie Memento, where the guy wakes up every day and he has no new memories. It's like the you know like let's build rail mobile missiles in the desert and put theater nuclear weapons um, around the world. One of the things about theater nuclear weapons in Europe was that they were part of a natural, one might even say integrated strategy that went from conventional fighting to tactical nuclear weapons on our own territory as NATO allies, potentially into a third area between the United States and Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and thence to eventually a link, the, and the whole point of those weapons was to link that war back to the American strategic deterrent. When we talk about them in Europe, uh, excuse me, in Asia, in the 21st century, it, we, it becomes this kind of thing in a vacuum. Well, we'll put theater nuclear weapons. And again, going back to my, my Michael Howard, favorite Michael Howard quote, to do what? Aimed at whom? For what purpose? With what consequences? In what situation? And I think because we don't want to think about how what it takes to build a bigger navy and to have um, prepositioned material and all that stuff, we say, well, <clears throat> we add this kind of dummy variable or this kind of balancing variable that says plus theater nuclear weapons. Okay, pay, Asia secure again. And I, and I think this goes back to the problem that we're not thinking through hard dilemmas and we're using these things to balance equations that we don't really want to think about the costs or the risks of. Um, and I, I think, you know, renuclearizing areas simply because we don't want to deal with other problems is a really bad idea. It's the stovepiping Stacy's talking about where you do that and then all the other stuff kind of falls by the wayside. And you say, well, I still have this other thing that was in a file here. Um, and I think that's incredibly dangerous. And I think it's, it forgets a lot of important lessons that we learned um, 30 or 40 years ago. You know, that is a good segue to the next question from the audience, uh, which is initially for Tom, but I think all the panelists will have something to say about this. Um, could you say more about what you describe as a pervasive aversion to scenario planning? Is this systemic and what caused it? Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, who hated scenario planning and insisted that we move to capabilities-based planning. Um, and I could understand why in the early post Cold War environment because you did have to shake people out of saying, you know, how are we planning? What do we need for the future? And you had guys, you know, um, I was young then, but guys that would be my age then saying, well, uh, Germany's still pretty dangerous. Got to do that full to gap thing. You know, I mean, no, all of our, all the places we were going to fight in Germany are all our allies. Now, what else do you have besides these scenarios? And, but that, I think, overtook us to say, well, let's think about capabilities. Let's think about effects. Let's think about the particular kind of weapon systems. And I think that led to the collapse along with the, a collapse on the part of the American Academy, on the part of American universities, to, that goes back to something Paul raised earlier, which is the collapse of area knowledge. Um, that we said, you know, you don't, to do scenario planning, you need to, if you're going to do scenario planning in Korea, it might help to know a lot about Korea. Who knows, maybe even speak Korean. Might not be a bad idea. Um, and that was just too difficult, too rigid, required too much deep knowledge. You couldn't cycle through a lot of people and programs quickly. You couldn't bring in outside SMEs that were, the universities were not producing those SMEs. Again, I feel kind of old in this sense that I was the product of a university system during the Cold War that said we can produce Soviet experts who teach in the academy, then go work in places like CSIS while, while they're studying at Georgetown and do that stuff. We, we've really dropped the ball on all of that, and I really, I thought 9-11 would shake us out of that. I really thought that we would just have a whole bunch of Arabic speaking, you know, Middle Eastern and Central Asian experts, and they just didn't, it just didn't happen, and it's not happening now. So I think that the collapse of scenario-based planning was partly a reaction to the Cold War, but it was also partly, we just did it because it was easier. It was just easier for us, and it was easier for the bean counters, and for the kind of Rumsfeldian, you know, transform, remember? transformation remember when we were going to do that um, you know and it just made all of those kind of new um, branding efforts easier uh, and cheaper and I and I think that is to not to our credit and not to the credit of American universities that needed to provide this kind of input to the American defense effort does anybody else want to jump in 
Sure. Um, so I, I agree, like uh, capabilities place planning, but I think that was driven by uncertainty about what the threats were and trying to have a sort of fungible capability set that you could apply to different areas. Not that I'm uh, in favor of this for the Pentagon, but I think we need to think about scenarios for what and for what purpose. And the Pentagon uses them for two different purposes, both of which are very specific, narrow, and important, but not necessarily strategic purposes. So they do for force planning, long term, what type of force do we need to build and have because it takes us a long time to do so, and how much of it do we need? And then they do operational planning for more near-term contingencies. Again, really important. We need to think this through, figure out what sort of plans we want to enact. Um, but those, there's only so much bandwidth to do those, and those often are used for strategic planning where there is a lot more uncertainty and where you do need to think about um, uh, more branches and sequels and different types of scenarios because we're surprised all the time. And I think uh, my colleague Becca Wasser has a project that is looking at this and how to use scenarios better, especially as you're thinking about, if you think of integrated deterrence as a whole of government, approach and uh, using the non-military tool, the same scenarios may not be appropriate for every situation. Um, the military does it for very specific reasons. Um, it's really important to remember, I run a lot of war games. Game scenarios are not predictive. It's not going to actually go down that way. Um, you need to think about how you are prepared to deal with that uncertainty. Okay. Um, uh, next question. Uh, do you think that the comprehensive scope of the Biden administration's definition of integrated deterrence actually reflects a sense of increased risks or, or opportunities in cyberspace or other maturing domains? No. Okay. <laughs> I think I disagree. I think that it is a little bit of both. It's the risk and the opportunity, and this is an extension of some of the thinking that we saw in the 2018 NDS and Nuclear Posture Review, where talking about non-strategic or strategic attacks that were not, um, not not nuclear, right? And this is sort of this vague phrasing where there's a suggestion that cyber attacks against civilian infrastructure and especially critical infrastructure are something that we're concerned about and we want to deter. Um, but I think there is also a hope that cyber is a magic button that allows us to sort of offset uh, uh, hard capabilities that we need and um, that, you know, cyber has proven to be really important. The information space is clearly very important, but it is not something that's really hard to plan for because it's not um, always reliable. There's a lot of uncertainty about whether an access will work and how it will work and what effect it will have. And thus far, we haven't seen the devastating cyber effects that some people had predicted. Even the Russians in Ukraine previously had, like, turned off the power for like, I think under a day in uh, parts of Kyiv, right? That's not um, the horrific scenario that um, some people have been worried about. So yes, it's sort of a hope that it's an easy button, and there are concerns about the risks, too. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, okay. I, 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 Stacy said it um, better and less glibly than I did, but I just don't think it represented some qualitatively new thinking, and I think the problem is, again, when you talk about these exercises, we say, and of course, cyber, mm. because it's just become like a reflex to say, and the cyber domain. And um, so I didn't, I, as far as I understand what the Biden administration is talking about, I don't think that has anything to do with, that's why I just said, no, I think they just appended every possible domain of conflict to this as an exercise in showing that they had thought about it. This one is, uh, I think, primarily directed for Mr. Choi, but I think um, it would be interesting for the rest of the panel to share their observations of what they're hearing from allies, which is, from an allied perspective, is deterrence by denial credible, compelling, and believable? Again, I think that devil's in the details. Um, oftentimes, when I read how Americans interpret deterrence by denial. Uh, sometimes they use the word absorb and attack uh, and you know, just hold off until reinforcements come in. And that I don't think is effective. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I think it depends on how you define deterrence by denial, uh, because that will uh, determine how cohesive uh, allies will be in adopting that as a strategy. I think it depends, you know, which allies you're talking about, which scenarios, um, and I think this is an area where there could potentially be misunderstanding because denying um, in any situation, whether we were to end up uh, in a war with Russia, China, North Korea, none of these are just cakewalks, and they're they're not going to be any of the Iraq wars uh, done over. All of these countries have more capabilities of various types, including nuclear weapons, that make them a very qualitatively different threat. Um, but denial is having enough to introduce enough uncertainty that they don't think they can uh, achieve whatever they're trying to do in aggressing. And so it doesn't mean that we have to have the perfect plan. We need to know exactly what we're going to do. But we need to show that we can do enough that they worry that they're not going to be able to win and they won't succeed. And I'll, I'll just bang this drum one more time. Deterrence of what? When you talk about deterrence by denial, what are you denying them? Um, you know, toward the end of the Cold War, NATO started to move toward a deterrence by denial strategy with things like the Rogers Plan and FOFA. These are, I feel like I'm talking about like the Maginot Line or something so far back. But, but our, the idea was we were going to strike deep into Soviet second and third echelons so that by the time they got to the front, they were useless and they couldn't take territory. So we weren't going to deter them by punishing them and you know, vaporizing Leningrad um, and killing a lot. We were basically going to say, you are just going to, we've built the equivalent of a conventional moat. You're going to keep banging your head against this wall. And then you will have to escalate. And if you have to escalate, there's that uncertainty that says, you just can't win this war. You're not going to do it. The problem is, and I'll just say it again, that requires a large investment in conventional weapons. Because that's how deterrence by denial works, is that you can tell your opponent that no matter how you start, you're not going to, you will eventually face the nuclear problem because everything else will fail because we have already backstopped all of that. And that's, that's no matter what their goal is, if there's enough conventional power to deter a military attack on a piece of territory or um, to attack uh, military assets that are not welcome in a particular area or whatever it is, if you have that conventional capability, then you can deter, basically tell your opponent, you're probably not going to succeed in doing this, and that's denial. But again, it keeps backing up to, do you have enough conventional forces to do that? So um, a question from the audience that, that pushes back a little bit, I think, on this. Um, there seems to be a panel consensus that the United States should focus on strengthening its conventional deterrence. Um, wouldn't this be a signal that nuclear deterrence is not working? Yeah. Um, no. Uh, I think that to, to say to strengthen conventional deterrence means that we are playing to our strengths. Um, just as when we were talking about things like cyber and, um, you know, the internet and cultural warfare and, you know, all of those things, uh, cultural warfare or, or cultural information operations, whatever we want to call them, to say this is actually an area of great strength for us, backstopped by the, the ability to to warn off anyone who would face that and then think they can resort to the nuclear option. Um, it's the other way around. I think that when you hollow out your conventional forces, you are inviting people to think about whether you're really going to rely on nuclear weapons because you've made it clear that you don't really intend to fight, you don't really want to deal with your with conventional war, you don't want to deal with a large military, and you're saying, well, I have these nuclear weapons. I, If I were an American opponent, I'd say, well, does that, I mean, think about the 1970s, right, where we, we literally go, the Army Chief of Staff says, I have a hollow military. And, you know, the, the answer is, well, we still have a lot of nuclear weapons. Our opponents around the world were not impressed by that. And I don't think, I think we were in a very shaky position in the late 70s. I, I was going to even say that 1950s, Eisenhower wanted to do this, right? And it was proven not to be credible. And in 1958, when he faced two crises, one with, over Taiwan and one in the Middle East with Lebanon, he realized, oh, crap, I need conventional forces that I can deploy in response because the only plan we have is to use nuclear weapons and nah, I'm not ready to do that here. So um, I do think that uh, 
nuclear weapons are, are mainly used to deter nuclear attacks and that um, with the stability and stability paradox, you have to think about how and if there are situations that there are lesser forms of aggression that you want to stop. I think two goals of advancing the conventional side. I, number one, short answer, they're not mutually exclusive. I think when it comes to risk of escalation, by advancing conventional weapons, you actually are able to manage it better by creating more rungs between the two levels. And then second, and this is the aspiration, is that potentially you might be able to turn nuclear weapons using conventional, which would be ideal. You know, that's a, a great segue to the last question, because uh, we're running out of time, and this has been a fascinating exchange. Um, but how should we think about the inadvertent escalation risks of integrated deterrence? And are there ways, in your view, to reduce those risks? Um, I, I'm not sure I asked the question, but I'm a little confused about what an inadvertent escalation risk of integrated deterrence is. I think there is always the possibility that um, we run afoul of something that, I think Paul brought this up, that is very important, that there's an asymmetry of interests, something very important to our opponent that maybe we didn't think about, that for them is an existential risk, like, you know, turning on the internet. I mean, I'm just going to keep dragging stuff out of my Cold War mental attic and, and remind you that Andre Gromyko, the foreign minister of the Soviet Union, said that if the United States had ever launched a satellite broadcasting television um, signals to the Soviet Union that the Soviets would consider it an act of war and shoot it down. Um, you know, because of course they would. Um, so, you know, could that would be a, an example of a integrated national security policy that somehow leads to war in a way that we didn't think of. But I think that's, I just want to keep pushing back on this notion of integrated deterrence and just call it foreign policy. Like, are there things we could do in our foreign policy that could annoy an adversary to the point where they might consider that an act of war? Yeah, well, that's why, that's why you have foreign policy experts and diplomats and SMEs and area specialists to make sure that you don't run afoul of that, but I don't know that that's intimately related to the problem of deterrence. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's more of an inadvertent escalation risk due to integrated deterrence, um, more not thinking seriously about the risks of nuclear use in different situations, and then just sort of the post-Cold War hangover where we're so used to our own superiority and relative uh, security that we um, attack things that without realizing that they ha are might be escalatory and hold great significance to potential opponents. So our option has normally been we can use conventional forces, whether it's going after the long range artillery and the Kaesong Heights. Uh, well, just doing that might prompt, you know, a nuclear response today. Or if it is doing launching attacks on the Chinese mainland or the Russian mainland or even Kaliningrad, we want to think about whether you actually uh, want whether that is a red line and that is something that you want to cross and need to do for uh, to achieve deterrence by denial or to actually defend your allies and yourself or not. And be sure that if we choose to cross those lines, we do so pretty with our eyes wide open of what the risks are. If, in if integrated deterrence is about an umbrella concept that, that gives you more options, then I also think that it provides more options to actually manage escalation, right? By potentially offering responses that don't necessarily uh, escalate tensions. Well, we are out of time. Of course, we've got more questions than we have time. But um, thank you so much to each of you for your fascinating comments and for such a vibrant exchange. Um, this is such a critically important issue as we think about US national security policy and how we're going to operate in this strategically complex world. Um, so thank you for sharing your thoughts. And, and, and um, if the audience could join me in also saying thank you. Um. Uh, it's lunches downstairs, so um, please.